How do you find the will to fight back against a world that wants to keep you sedated, average, and stuck in place? Join us for the tools and strategies you need to create a life of abundance, discipline, and high achievement. This, this, is, this is the Tactical Empire with Jeff Smith. Welcome to another edition of The Tactical Empire. Today, I'm here with a friend of mine, Mark Ruiz from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He has uh, been a real estate investor and a developer for about 20 years. And uh, today, I plan on having some interesting conversations with him about the real estate market, what he sees coming um, based on his experience. And I, I just can't wait to get him advising you guys on his feedback and opportunities he sees in the marketplace. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Absolutely. And I I didn't want to sell your your experience short. So tell me a little bit about uh, what what you've been doing over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, I I started off with uh, Robert Allen's No Money Down in like 2005. So it's, it's been, you know, I, I, st- I built my career. I'm a flipper by trade. So I've been doing construction uh, remodels for about 14 years. The last 10 years, we, I, I, I like, I like to do, I make my money doing crap no one else wants to do. Um, so we, we moved into the affordable housing space. I moved into North Tulsa. We started buying the worst houses you could find. I mean, we're buying houses, five, $10,000. Um, we being in the, in the lower income community, we start doing, doing a lot of section eight. We're doing a lot of vouchers. We do veteran vouchers, um, homeless prevention programs. And, um, we, we've evolved a little bit. Um, we, we focus on entry level workforce section eight, just that affordable housing space. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. And so you, you do ground up and flipping mm-hmm. both. So we, we, we do ground up flipping. We have been. F- so we went from doing, you know, your, your traditional flip first time home buyers at entry level space, you know, that 150, $200,000 house range. Then we, we, we tried to go higher. We went higher uh, values and it turns out it's an entirely different market, entirely different clientele. People who have money that are more sophisticated and have bought houses before that are very specific on what they want. And they don't really care what you did. Uh, so we, we, we like, we, we, we figured out that we make more money in that affordable housing space and people are just dying to have it. Not only are they dying to have it, there's just not a lot of options available. So, sure. um, and then we switched. Sorry, there's a huge need there in that market. There's a gap. There's sure. a huge you- need. Um, you know, part of my transition was I was making too much money uh, and I needed tax write-offs. And then yep. the other part of it was, you know, flipping houses is great, but it's a high paying job. I mean, you've got to keep trading time for money. You still got to go work and buy the houses and flip the houses to be able to make a check. So we switched to the rental market and, you know, the, the margins on the nicer houses are not there. Um, yeah. You know, people like to play this 1% game and it doesn't make any sense to me because you're not making any money. Um, you know, in my mind, one and a half is my minimum, but two is where you need to be. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And you own a property management company now too, huh? So that was a evolution of necessity. I, I started managing myself. You know, we had one, two, five, ten, 10, up to 60 houses. Uh, I brought my wife in to take over management at that point. And then we grew to about th- close to 300 doors. Um, and I was, we got into uh, the rent to retirement kick. Uh, Roofstock guys, st- we, we started selling turnkey because we were actually remodeling faster than what we could refinance. So, okay. you know, what I what I did is we developed a machine in North Tulsa where we were going and buying these houses. I was buying them so cheap. I was literally you know, walking down the street buying houses. And at that price point, we could just afford to, to let them sit there until we got to them. So I had, you know, years of inventory when everything crashed. Okay. Um, but you know, we, so we go in and we got to the point where we could remodel about five houses at a time. And it was just, um, 
get them. And when we do remodels, being a flipper and owning construction company, mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I learned is I don't like maintenance. Uh, make, you, if you try to maintain these things out of cash flow, you're starved. And it's much more economical or much best to build it into the investment and amortize it over the 20 years, like roll it yeah. into the damn deal. You know, you, you, you try to save a dollar up front, it's going to cost you $2 later. It just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So, you know, we, we go into North Tulsa, we look at, we get in these neighborhoods and, you know, you, you have stereotypes of the other side of the tracks, right? You're like, you know, you, you hear, you hear things, you have um, an expectation when you work in low income or section eight, like you hear those words and you think of things, right? Yeah. Um, what, what I found when we got there, so there's a lot of good people who weren't given yeah. the same opportunity, that didn't have the same resources or the same information that we do. And instead of helping them, we have the nerve to label them. It doesn't, you know, it, it, but anyhow, so we go into North Tulsa and we, we, we see that there's a lot of slumlords. Uh, yep. And our our product, we we do a we believe everyone should have a nice place to live, regardless of economic or environmental circumstances. So when we remodel a rent house, we take it to the studs. I mean, I'm doing new electrical, plumbing, heat and air, roofing, windows, siding, uh, kitchen cabinet. I mean, it just it it doesn't make sense to try to put piece these things back together, especially yeah. if it's a long term investment. So just just do it right, put it in the deal, uh, and then you can cash flow now. This works in North Tulsa or this works in affordable housing because of the price points. Right. It doesn't work when you go 250 and above. No, on, it, barely, on, it barely works 150 or above. Actually, yeah. it used to work at that 150 to 250 range, but with rates, I just can't justify being doing anything that's more than $100,000. I mean, really, that sweet exactly. spot is that six. They used to be 60. Now that $80,000 house is because of inflation. But right. anything over 100 grand, it's just you can't cash flow it. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing the same things. We're, yeah, uh, of course. I, I think what you said uh, is such a key learning point that people need to pick up on, um, which is something I learned a long time ago on finance all your mechanical repairs on the way in, because then what you're doing is you're pushing off your maintenance for three to five years. And um, that's not to say things won't go wrong, but if you don't get all new <laughs> upgraded units as you go in, upgraded electrical boxes, upgraded HVAC, all of that stuff, it, water heaters, it will nickel and dime you to death as a small landlord. That, which yeah. is why I, I bird our first 40 properties and I bird into them. And so I, I'm very familiar with the model that you're using. And I, but I think that that I'd be remiss not to point out that you mentioned that because that's super important and people don't understand it because you've got these homes that cash flow 300 400 500 bucks a month and they when they have a $1500 repair that's half a year it's 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 a quarter's profit you know how many times saving money has cost me more than if i would have just done it like you know trying to find the cheap way out has always resulted in a bigger expense whenever yeah. it comes back around. Um, sure. So, you know, my path, I I was flipping and I, I started, I, I found another investor, an older investor who became a very good friend of mine, but he, he sold me, he owner financed me 50 houses in, in about 12 months, 12 month time frame. And these are were, uh, houses that he remodeled and he did a good job, but sure. he didn't do what we do and it was from taking on that large group of houses and there are safety in numbers i believe anything less than 50 is a hobby and really you need 100 doors or more to be sustainable to be self-sufficient um so that that having to deal with working maintaining maintaining these houses while owning a construction company and doing flips and having that background it just it drives me crazy that you know these people just come in here lipstick it and, and think it's gonna be a good long-term investment yep there's issues every month when you do that every single month there's there's maintenance to be spent on them so I, I rabbit trailed a little bit so on the property management so yes we 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 do it ourselves and it's 
not that we like property management or even that we want to do property management. We just haven't found anyone else. Uh, and we've tried. Uh, we, we've outsourced uh, three different times. And each time has resulted in it. it we just we just hired a property manager under my wife and we, we carry what we need. So we, um, it, it's done right. That makes sense. That makes um, sense. A good property management management is worth their weight in gold. A bad one can bankrupt you. Yep. So you went through uh, 08, 09 then in, in that same market. In Texas, um, right? So I, I did go, I, I did go through 08, 09. Um, I didn't survive it. Um, I, 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 I bowed out for a few years and went back to doing sales. Um, fortunately I was in my, my mid twenties at that point. So I didn't have a lot to lose. So it was okay. Right. Uh, 2012 is when I, 2011, 2012 was when I, I dove back in and I quit my job and went back to just buying houses. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's awesome. Um, so based on what you're seeing today, what are you, what are you thinking? It, the similarities, the differences, things like that. I mean, obviously it's a different marketplace, but we're, we're heading into, I mean, I, we've been kind of teetering on a recession for a while and speculation is it's here. Um, it's, it's definitely here. We, we feel it in, in, in the higher end properties more because we do, since we do ground up and we still do flips, um, I, I'm still, I'm still playing with the market and I'm seeing that the things that are over 200 have considered dramatically dropped, but are, are, are entry level or 200 price point in our rent houses. Um, they, we can't get them out fast enough. Um, you know, we, we always had this joke, you know, when you fish the bottom of the barrel, it doesn't matter how far the, bar the barrel falls. You're already at the bottom. Um, everyone's always going to need houses that is never going to change and they're not making any more land. So there, you, your, your choices, you know, right now we're experiencing a little bit more of the realization of what people can really afford, what yeah. they have been able to buy lately because and money was, has been cheap, nearly free. Yeah. And if you, you, and it's unusual, I mean, unusually low that is not normal this or eight nines this is normal like you look the 30 year 40 year average whatever it is we're where we're this is normal this yep. is not crazy high this isn't 18 percent. this is at the 80s 70s 80s but it's it, you know that to expect money to be free forever is, is unrealistic also i i agree i agree i think that the demand is what's driving that bottom tercile of houses as far as price points and it's it's an interesting thing to watch because there's a lot of competitors in that market right there's flippers there's buy and hold guys there's big portfolio investors there's hedge fund money and and there's the end user that wants to buy those too, first time home buyers. And so <laughs> there, there's it's a, a lot of competition. And ironically, most of them have dialed back. And I, I do see it. I don't see any dramatic changes. I don't see any crashes coming. I mean, I, I think it, it is definitely leveled off. And I do think that there is a, the momentum is not upward. Uh, yeah. It, I don't, I don't, I don't see. Well, I mean, if we ha if we crash, it's not going to be the same kind of crash. No, it's going to be completely different. The the bottom has already been reached with regards to housing prices. It, the data is showing we're climbing nationally, and and it bottomed out at the end of July, um, based on price point. The dip that we experienced was right there in the summer after school um, got out, and it, what we're seeing now is just a completely in my opinion, is a behavior change. And and how is it going to change going forward with 7% interest rates on primary residences? For So people are hunkering down and not moving when they otherwise would have been upgrading houses or getting more bedrooms, square footage, things like that is what we're seeing more than anything else because of affordability. And so are you seeing the same things in Tulsa? 
Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of that. People who have mortgages in place are not likely to trade out of their two to three percent for seven or eight plus. They're not doing the upgrades. Um, we are seeing a, the institutional buyers have considerably slowed down. The landlords are not able to cash flow. So, you know, the, the properties that they were competing against a year or two ago are now sitting there. Um, but the, the 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 buyers are a little more shy, I guess. You know, we're still seeing um, movement. It's not like what we were. We're not, you know, we're not able to um, drive up the, the the comps and the values like what we what we were able to the last few years. You know, I've been doing this so long. I remember when paying the seller or the buyer's closing cost was normal. And when we first started getting offers without people asking for closing costs, I was, it, it kind of caught me off guard because I was so used to it. Now we're seeing that kind of stuff again. Yep. Uh, people are also getting much more, I don't know what, their their offers are lower. Like I'm, I've seen a lot more lowball offers on like brand new properties that we're putting out there, or even in the rentals, people trying to negotiate lower rent rate. Um, so and thing days on market are considerably longer than what they used to be. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Inventory is is recovering a bit, but we're still not to a full six months. No, and 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 you look at the markets are. You have distinctive size markets. You have your 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 large. Um, well, I can't even remember what they call them anymore. Your 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 California, your Dallas, your De your Texas, Houston. You know, you have your large movements, and you have your uh, your ripple markets are kind of just the the outward movements of that. And then Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, we don't have. We're, I guess, fiduciary markets, what they call us. We refer to it as cash flow market. We're, we're very stable. We don't have hyperinflation. We don't really drop much. We just kind of, the, the, the needle just kind of steady moves along. You know, mm -hmm. it is unusual for us to see uh, more than, you know, a five or eight. Actually, traditionally, I think our average market average is a 2.7 or maybe three point in, percentage increase. Um, in the last couple of years, you know, we're seeing double digits, which is unusual here. Um, but because of that, our, I don't know, our affordability, we, we're, we're much lower price point than the rest of the country. Right. Right. But I mean, there, no one's impervious to this appreciation that's gone on over the last three years, though. I no, mean, that's, no. that's what you see in your, your double digits when you don't expect them usually. And so it, it's it's an interesting market. Let me let me use that as the transition and the segue into you have experience in uh, mobile home parks, correct? Correct. We have two parks yeah. in Oklahoma. Okay. And so let's let's talk about that and some other opportunities potentially coming out of this like glut of our, our supply issue that we're having. Um, there, I, I, I think that there's going to be opportunities. I know that there's going to be opportunities over the next few years um, for investors and for developers and other opportunities to provide this level of affordable housing for people because of the demand. I mean, we're at seven and a half million shortage on homes, units, seven and a half million short. And so we've got to come up with some solutions. So what do you see from that regard? And then we can talk mobile homes as much as you want to. You know, I, I like the the mobile home park model for multiple reasons. You know, I, my, I, I've spent my career, my life in single family. I understand houses. I understand the, this game. I've got, I've, I've got a pretty good grasp on it. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I decided the ev next evolution was of things were to get into the multifamily space. Mm -hmm. And I went in with Investor Fuel and, and, and Corey, Corey Peterson. And I trained, you know, 18 months I spent really just dissecting the multifamily. And it turns out that I don't like it. Um, I, there, there are two, there, there are things, there are aspects of these larger, nicer properties that just don't interest me. Um, what I did take away from that was the mobile home parks, and it's kind of a hybrid between your multifamily because you have multiple units on a property, but you still have single family traits. You don't have um, as many – it's easier to isolate issues and fix things. And it's sure. also 
after owning and operating hundreds of houses, the idea of being responsible for dirt is really appealing. <laughs> but more than anything is you can't mass produce houses. You can't, you know, it, it takes years. I mean, multiple 18 to 24 months to do any kind of infrastructure engineering development to be able to start building houses. And then how long it takes to, you know, take the house and make from, from dirt to CO um, versus how quickly we can put together these manufactured homes. Now I'm not talking, you know, we like trailer parks. I buy trailer parks, but our objective is we, we go in there, reposition them and make it a nice quality, respectful place to live because there's, because of the, the market, the inflation and the rates, what, people can afford and what people want have changed. And then there's still those people who, who want some form of, they need something more affordable, but they still want a yard. They still want, you know, they don't want to be necessarily sharing walls with people. Correct. Yep. So I mean, are you running the model that you run as far as your mobile home? Do you, do you do lot rent? And or and they're they're park owned or are they are they? In, I, in I have I have both and in Hera and it, it, it kind of is just the way that we bought the park was Hera and we bought everything was on a rent to own basis and we were getting um, we all get rent to own on the on the trailer and then the lot rent um, and then during then we the next year we bought Omogi and Omogi was everything was park owned and it was all bills paid and it, it was a completely different model. Um, there's pros and cons to both. Um, sure. I don't like all bills paid, but however, when you're dealing with people in the lower income class, especially those that are on set income, social security, you know, th th uh, they, they don't have a lot of flexibility. We found that a, it's a lot more attractive to only have one payment to pay and everything is taken care of because they don't have the ability to really deal with fluctuations. Now, the downside of that is we have to absorb fluctuations. Some days, some months are better than others. Um, and we also have a lot less, I don't want to say maintenance issues, but, you know, when people can't afford to pay their utilities and things get shut off, it creates new problems for us. Yeah. Yeah. They improvise. Um, Sure. And then, you know, going in and trying to clean up a park when people have a rent to own status or they own their own their trailers, it's really hard to convince them to conform and, and uh, clean up with the rest of the property. Um, it, it, we found that there was a lot more. What's the word I'm looking for? I mean, they're they're much more combative to change or yep. less more less less cooperative you know and, and yep. then i'm not against the for uh, rent to own model or even the owner finance model i just there has to has to they ha, what we do is a 12-month lease you have to not violate the lease and prove to us that you're a good fit for the park because at the end of the day if I don't want your money if you're just going to come in and make my life harder or make it, you know, make it more difficult for other people or, you know, getting in shootouts with the neighbors or having the SWAT team come out. I'm not making this up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure uh, you're not, you know, in trailer parks and, and, and depending on what kind of park you want to run and what you're willing to put up with, there's going to be a lot. Traditionally, most trailer parks are very lax on regulation rules and what they and, and keeping holding people responsible so when you come in there and you're trying to make it nice you know you get, you're gonna have a lot of unfortunately there's a lot of sex offenders you have a lot of criminals you got a lot of drug dealers which um fortunately for me we've had mostly drug dealers and just by you know increasing the, the police and the sheriff's presence and running people out i mean it, it 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 cleared up a lot of our problems but there was a few that dug in because they were on a rent to own status like i own my trailer you can't tell me what to do right my ass. right <laughs> you move your yeah. trade off my park and that's why a, a, a park takeover the transition is difficult because the because they, they do own the asset and they have a really difficult time moving because to transport 
their home is $5,000. 5,000 single, 10,000 double. And that's yep. providing that it's movable condition. Yes. And that that's another thing that is like, if you tell someone that their home is not movable and it, then you're, and you're still trying to evict them, where, where do you, how do you meet in the middle? Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've had this, I've, I've had this problem twice. Um, the last one, we, well, we got lucky. We bluffed, we took him to court. He was behind. We, we should have had to do foreclosure, but we, we he he got the message and he, he finally left. But it, it literally took um, getting the sheriff out there involved to get him to move on. Um, the other one went to prison because he was dealing drugs and we just happened to you know put up cameras that caught him doing stuff. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so you've been involved in a bunch of different asset classes. What's your favorite asset class currently? Well, I like the new construction because I know what's behind the wall. We put it there. Yep. Uh, I, I still really like my, my little 60, $80,000 houses because they cash flow. Um, I, we, we spend most of our time in the new, in the new construction. We do infill lots. I don't like development. Uh, I don't have the, the patience, uh, and the, the attention span to do 18 to 24 months of engineering. Also, I, after having worked with a couple engineers, I figured out that we do not speak the same language. We do not understand each other. Uh, and they don't work well with others. I mean, in, engineers are a special breed. Nothing wrong. Nothing. I mean, I, great guys, good friends of mine. But we just we do not speak the same language. Like I don't understand it. I give me vertical. I can we can throw a house up in a hundred days. You know, I, we 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 probably have eighty guys out running at any given time. Eighty between eighty and hundred guys on the ground. We can go from dirt to drywall 30, 40 days, and we can be done in 110, 100, 110. Now, it also depends on how many we're, we're running. We're probably running. I think we're running a dozen right now. Okay. Gotcha. Um, we, we still do flips. Just uh, I'm a house buying junkie. I just would never, it's a good deal. I can't resist. Um, I, I've, I've been in the last couple of years because I did kind of see this coming, um, you know, 2018, 2019, 20. We sold off a couple hundred great houses. I sold them off because people out of state and buyers, these rental retirement or roof stock, these um, most of them were California buyers, were paying double what I had in it. In my opinion, stupid money, and I just you know, I perpetuated the problem. Uh, but you know, I'll buy it all back when it crashes. Right. Um, right. You know, there. This is the time that people the people who are playing investor are going to fall out. This is the time that we're going to act. People who thought they were good realize that this, it was the environment. This is where we separate the, the guys that get shit done to the guys that talk about it. Yep. You're seeing lending tighten up tremendously. And lending I think that's, what's gonna... up. yeah, these bankers are finicky. The hard money guys are, are still going strong, but they're raising rates because they can. Uh, so they're, they're, what I see is that they've reduced their leverage points and increased their cost because uh, they still want to do business because that's how they make their money. But they're also trying to uh, increase the uh, scan of the game, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Um, so where do you see the opportunities being in the next couple of years with what's going on? Are you doing seller financing with these deals that you've got that you're selling? We have not, but we are actually exploring that idea. We're looking at models on what that would look like, especially on the new construction. It looks very appealing to me. Um, I have my reservations about it because it's very simple to evict. It is not as simple to foreclose. Although if you give me enough money down, I would hope that you would stay. But again, you, you never know. Um, I have known some guys in my career that have approached that less than ethically, in my opinion. And they just set people up because they, they just want the down payment. Um, so I'm not 
I've done it a handful of times, but I've never made it a model. Yep. I'm seriously considering it and I'm doing some research and some homework. And I, I do know, I found a few guys that are doing it, what I consider the right way. Uh, and they are doing really well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, but for opportunities, I kind of just put that in your mouth as far as like the seller financing. So like, what else do you see? Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, I see, um, the entry level space, the the workforce housing, the Section Eight, and we we're in Oklahoma, so we have Native American tribes all over the place. So we work we work very closely with several of the tribes. Um, what I what I see is the the trailers, you know, and we like to go in there. We buy new newer used trailers and drop them and go. Like you put me in a trailer park that has ten empty spots, I'll have. 10 new trailers in there because we're not waiting for people to bring stuff in. We're going to bring in the trailers for $30,000, which you yep. can't do a house for that. I promise you right. that right. Um, we, we can remodel a trailer for $30,000 or we could buy and set one for about $35,000. That's, you know, 10, 20 years old. Okay. We drop those on site. We're renting them for a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks a month. Um, and we're talking matter of days. Yeah. Once you have your, once you have your system in place and you have the park. Sure. Um, I, I see the need for um, affordable rentals and affordable is relative because what I, you know, these section eight, four bedroom houses used to rent for 800. Now they rent for 1200, same damn house, same damn house. It's only been five years. Right yeah. Now. yeah. In the last five years, it's gone up. What is that? 30% and you went from 800 to 1200 for the same, for the same damn house. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I see the opportunity for the people who are willing to go out and get dirty. You know, the ones that just want to go and find a, a quick, easy flip or want to do a nice, uh, you know, hundreds, you know, few, 200, 250 or above house. I, I see struggle, you know, I do with these builders, you know, you can't, you can't hardly see a new construction house for under 300 grand, but. Most people can't afford it. Right. I'm yeah. the only guy in town besides Habitat that's building houses for 200,000. Really? Really. Wow. Now we, we have shrunk the house a little bit, you know, we're th doing a three, two, three, two, two, uh, 1250 square feet. And I'm really into duplexes. I, I'm building a dozen duplexes right now um, because I see that if you can still qualify and we're duplexes and quads right now I'm building duplexes, um, I want to do quads. I'm looking for places where I can do zoning for the quads. Uh, however, so the, du the duplexes, I like duplexes because you can, they're still FHA conventional and VA qualifiable. You can live in one side and rent the other side to offset. Um, there's also this thing where I guess generational is like you, 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 you live on one side, your aging parents on the other side or your, your kids that you can't quite get you want out of the house but they're not ready to go on their own you put them next door but what really is you could to an investor's house hack deal go buy it on an fha or a va loan put three percent down five whatever it is you live there for a year and then buy another one do it again but yep. in the meantime somebody else is paying a good chunk of your rent yep exactly and to exactly. my investor buyers now you have dual income to cover the debt service Exactly. I've got a bunch of duplexes. I love them. Yeah. I, I, other than zoning purposes, I don't see me building more houses. Okay. Now when we go in and we do something, I, you know, when I decided we were going to build houses, I went about a hundred lots. So I, I, I still have a bunch of land, you know, even when, when we were doing the remodeling in North Tulsa, I had, you know, I, at any given time had dozens of houses just sitting there empty boarded up waiting for us to get to. Like if I, if I didn't buy anything, we could still work for about two more years. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. It becomes an addiction. Oh, well, by yeah. absolutely. Getting the deal becomes an addiction for sure. Well, and then if you, if you know, you, you got to play where it's not popular. I, I make my living doing shit. No one else wants to do. Um, it, it's, you know, looking at what's going on and not being where people are, but where are they not? 
And then knowing what we know of the market trends and the rates and the affordability issues, it doesn't make sense to go bigger. Right. I'm not saying that people won't. But to me, the, these little, that under $100,000 price point is where you're going to cash flow. Now, cash flow is my game. You know, yeah. um, if you're going to flip, we're doing great at the 200 price point. Well, they're, they're not going to sit. They're not going to sit on the market at all at 200. No. There's too many eyeballs on them, like we were talking about earlier. There's just too much need and demand. So that that's super smart. I mean, I know some investors down here in Texas that are doing the same thing, like developing affordable housing. And I think it's brilliant because you can put it together like a flipping model and move at a decent rate of speed to where you carve off a, a steady profit from each one. And the house is pre-sold in some cases before it's even done. Like <laughs> preferably most of the time, that's what we, what we aim for. Um, it, it, it's just, you know, we, we, we learn, we adapt, you know, that that's my, my greatest superpower is I'm going to have a willingness to make mistakes. I have very little shame, so I don't give a shit. It's what, you know, take, take what we learn, move, you know, that didn't work. Do this. Well, I mean, this is in alignment with the like philosophy of this show, which is like build your empire and like it's it's to create legacy wealth. And and I am a huge believer that over the next three to five years, there's going to be a massive transfer of wealth and there's going to be tons of opportunity because of the things that you're discussing specifically. And, and those that are willing to get out there and find the niches that other people don't want to solve the problem for it, are the people that are going to be rewarded handsomely. And so like everything you're saying is spot on philosophically to what we're, we're talking about on here all the time. So like, thank you for all your knowledge. Um, tell, tell me, uh, how can people find you? And um, you mentioned some educational tools or something that you've got. Are you teaching courses? We're, we're putting some courses together. You know, I, I, I struggle with this myself, most personally, um, because, you know, I, I have, I've been doing this for nearly 20 years and I, I'm a big believer in education and training. And I, 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 I'm the guy that spends six figures a year on coaching, even today. Like, I, and you're in Apex, I'm in Apex. I mean, I just keep leveling up. I just went executive with student. Uh, you know, I, I have, I, you know, it, 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 we're, we're constantly learning. We're constantly evolving. I forgot the question. Where was I going? <laughs> how, can, how can people reach you? Oh, people reach out to the education. That's what it was. So yeah, this, this is, it's a double edged sword. I, I, I love, I want to give back the information that I have because I, you know, it's, I've spent millions of dollars putting this stuff in my head. And I know right. that, you know, if, if somebody could come in there and, and grasp some of these concepts, they could change their life. But at the same time, I'm a doer. I'm not a teacher. I'm not very good at educating. I'm not very good at sitting still. It's like I get shit done. So right. I'm putting together these courses and it has been much more of a personal, I don't know. It, it's hard for me to sit down long enough to do the courses and I don't like being on camera. So like the part of this is I'm trying to get comfortable in this position and having these conversations and doing this. It's like, cause I just don't do it. <laughs> um, how to get a hold of me. That's a good question. How do you get a hold of me? I should have an answer for this. Instagram. No, Facebook is probably the best bet, to be honest. I'm very right. technically challenged, which is why I joined Apex. All right. Well, we'll drop we'll drop Mark's uh, profile out there in the show notes. It's M-A-R-C, Ruiz, Ruiz, R-U-I-Z. And uh, he's in Tul Tulsa, Oklahoma. But man, you have a plethora of knowledge and decades of experience. And so... Definitely keep on putting your word out there, man, and helping people because it, especially in the like verticals that you play in, in, in the real estate investment game, I, I truly believe that they are just, it, it's a necessary area. Like I said, I mean, we've got some Section 8 homes. We've messed with uh, mobile home parks. I just think that there's so much opportunity in those two particular spaces 
Um, now, are there that many eighty thousand dollar homes left? Not a ton, but they, they're depends out on, there. Depends on where you play. It, uh, it does. Around. Houston and Houston, I don't think you're going to find a lot anywhere right. in Texas. You know, unless you're in West Texas, I don't see you finding a lot. But you know, in Oklahoma, I can walk down the street in North Tulsa, and we can find them. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I tracking back, I thought of something else. Another big opportunity that I see that has been that I haven't seen in, in a long time is uh, seller financing is subject to deals. I'm seeing yep. a ton of that popping up where, especially the subject to deals, because, you know, I, I could pay you your, you know, a hundred thousand cash, or I could give you this, take over the mortgage. And especially on those low debt mortgages, I mean, it, you, you can't buy money that cheap if you want right. to. Uh, yep. And then also with these, with, with these sellers, you know, knowing that like, like the older sellers, the people that have been in the house for years and years and years, and they have the equity, they own it outright free and clear or indoor, you know, whatever the situation may be. But they, if they own the property free and clear, it, you know, if giving them a lump of cash, which one isn't going to be the amount that they want, because now the house isn't worth what it used to be because I can't sell it because of the rates. Yep. So if I can give them cash flow, prevent them a large taxable event and make money on the deal it worked we have new we have new ways of being creative that hasn't been available because money has been nearly free yes yeah i, I same i'm a huge fan of the subject to and the seller financing on those paid off mortgages especially because you can drop it like you said you can drop a down payment based on what they need right now and then you can put together essentially an annuity or a pension plan for them on like how much is a monthly payment that you're comfortable with and they're like a thousand bucks a month and you're like done it'll rent for 1600 or whatever well, you know <laughs> as a real as an investor real estate investor investor are most people think that we're out here just to make money but the real answer is we're here to solve problems we're here to uh, to to offer creative solutions that most people wouldn't have thought about. Because I, I don't know about you, I don't operate inside the box. I don't even know where the box is. It's, I hadn't seen it in a long time, I don't know. Um, but I have resources and abilities to do things that other people don't see and can't do. Yep. You know, So is giving somebody cash for their property the best solution for them? And lots of times it's not. Right. So right. You know, we, we, we need to go in, we we have the opportunity to go in and help people and get paid to do it. You know, you got to keep that in mind. You, you, we're not running a charity by any means, but we can do very good, very well by giving back to the community. Um, you know, one of my things I like to say is we do good by doing good for the neighborhood. You know, our our objective is for wherever we are, wherever we work to be better for us having been there, whatever yep. that may look like. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Well, Mark, we're, we're short on time at this point, but thank you, sir. I appreciate you. I, I appreciate you coming on and I appreciate you giving back to the community and helping out and you're doing amazing things. I, I definitely am going to see you at apex next month. And so we'll link up then, uh, keep on doing what you're doing, man. And, we can uh, swap notes as we continue to grow. Yeah, no, I'd love to stay in touch. For sure, man. So thank you. Oh, I gotta, gotta love the dog. <laughs> have I, have, a great I day, have three, man. so I, that's why I don't do Zooms from home. Because <laughs> it yes. never fails. Never fails. Yeah. Exactly. Between, between exactly. that and the kids, it's like, man, I, okay, I just need to go to the office. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, man, I, I, I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person uh, in a couple of weeks. And um, you let me know if you need anything. I'm happy to help. I Like I said, I appreciate you coming on here. Keep on doing what you're doing. I, I, uh, I hope I didn't ramble too much. And uh, no. I look forward to chatting again. You did great, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate hey, it. Hey, uh, Ryan, you got what you need, man? Thank you. Thank you for listening to the show. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share with a friend. We'll, we'll, we'll see you we'll see on the next episode, next episode of the Tactical Empire.